You will hear a human resources manager talking about her company's work-life balance policy. First, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. In our company, we believe that our employees are more productive, you know, they work better if they're happy. Naturally, we have to make sure the company makes a profit, but at the same time, we need to think about the physical and mental health of our employees. We do understand that they aren't just working machines, so we have a policy of helping them find a fair balance between their work and their private lives, what we call a work-life balance. We do this in several ways. Firstly, we have a family-friendly policy, so parents can look after their children when they're very young. For example, sometimes they need to work flexible hours, you know, times that aren't fixed. Other times, parents have to work part-time, and quite a lot work from home. Another example of our family-friendly policy is our generous maternity leave package. In our company, we allow women who've had a baby to take a whole year off work after the baby's born. And of course, while they're away, their jobs are protected. Before you hear the next part of the talk, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 6, 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 8. Because we want our employees to be happy, we carried out a survey recently to find out which working patterns are really most popular. In general, our staff prefer to work at the office. In fact, nearly half come in during regular office hours, you know, from 9 to 5. Anyway, we also asked about part-time work working from home, and another option, job sharing. Job sharing is a kind of part-time work where two people share the responsibilities for one full-time job. Anyway, we found that only 5% of our staff wanted to share a job, so it's not very popular on the whole. But when it comes to working part-time, we were surprised to find that 27% of our employees would actually prefer it. That's a very high number, really, over a quarter of the staff. And then it was interesting to see that quite a lot of our staff, 20% in fact, would like to work from home. I'd like to give you an example of the kind of person who benefits most from our family-friendly policy. Sally is one of our assistants in accounting who has two small children. Sally's husband travels abroad a lot, so she has to look after the children on her own most of the time. Both the children go to a nursery early in the morning. So we've agreed that Sally can come in at 8 o'clock after she leaves the children. At lunchtime, Sally's sister picks the children up from the nursery. But she has to go to work herself at 3 o'clock. So Sally leaves the office at 2 to collect the children from her sister's and she makes up the extra time by finishing her work at home. That is the end of Section 2. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a woman talking about health and safety when using a computer. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 and 12.
Listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 and 12. Hello everyone and welcome to the second session on health and safety. And today we're focusing on health and safety when using a computer. Now, can you all gather round this workstation here? That's great, thanks. OK, now, let's look at some equipment that is specifically designed for safe computer use. Firstly, take a look at this item here. Yes, the sloped slab in front of the keyboard. Does anyone know what it is? That's right, it's a wrist rest. And it does a lot more than take up room on your desk, I can tell you. <laughs> well, what does it do exactly? In actual fact, it's specifically designed to support your wrist when you're typing or when you're using a computer mouse. Now, the one I'm holding in my hand is made of foam rubber. Come on now, have a feel. You know you want to. Now, it's very flexible, isn't it? The padding is firm, but it also gives way when you press it, just like this. Here's another type, by the way. This one is filled with gel. Now, like the foam rubber type, it's got a firm surface, but when you press it like this, it gives way with a little spring. However, not all wrist rests are flexible like that. Some are made from hard plastic. That doesn't sound like a comfortable support for your wrist, does it? So, not to be recommended. Now you have some time to look at questions 13 to 17. Now listen to the next part of the talk and answer questions 13 to 17. OK, so we know what kind of material we're looking for in a wrist rest. But what else do we have to think about before we choose one? Now look again at the foam rubber wrist rest here. You can see that the slope of the wrist rest and the height and the width too match the front edge of the keyboard here. And there are no sharp edges. Look, it's really nice and smooth. Now, we know it's a busy time for you all at the moment. You're busy with assignments in between the hours you're spending browsing the net and going on social networking sites. <laughs> well, just think about how hard your wrist has to work. So, using a wrist rest like this one can really help in a number of ways. First of all, it helps you keep your wrist straight when you're using your computer. I'm demonstrating this now. As you can see, my wrist is neutral and straight rather than bent up and down. See what I mean? Now, it can also provide padding for your hands. It works in much the same way as a cushion, so it makes your desk much more comfortable. Now, please note, I did say cushion rather than pillow. We don't want you students to be too comfortable. Another advantage of a wrist rest is that it stops your hands from dropping off the edge of the keyboard. A wrist rest can also relieve tension and soreness in your neck and shoulders. And how does it do that exactly? Well, it removes the weight of your arm from your shoulders and neck altogether. So there are a lot of benefits, aren't there? However, most people never learn how to use a wrist rest correctly. In fact, leaning your wrists on a wrist rest for long periods can put a lot of pressure 
on the undersides of your wrists, just here. Now you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions 18 to 20. So, to make the most of your wrist rest, it's really important to follow a few basic tips. First of all, make sure you place your wrist rest approximately one and a half inches away from your keyboard like this. And never ever place your wrists directly on your wrist rest. Instead, place the palm or ball of your hand on the rest. And another thing, don't use the wrist rest all the time, particularly when you're typing. Instead, your hands should be on the wrist rests during break periods, so between your typing sessions. This will avoid you putting strain on your wrists and fingers. Now, does anyone have any questions before we move on to computer glasses? That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answer. Section 3. You are going to listen to a conversation between two students talking about a lecture they have just attended. First, look at questions 21 to 24. There are four alternative answers, A, B, C and D, for each question. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the appropriate letter. Henry, don't you think Dr Adams' lecture was really very good? He could talk about the telephone directory and make it interesting. All his lectures are like that, Astrid. He's just one of those people. I wish we had him as our tutor. I bet you that he is very demanding, though. Boris is in his tutorial group and agrees that he is a brilliant lecturer, but he puts them under a lot of pressure. Hmm. But don't you think that's good? Perhaps. But I am glad to have Dr. Adams as a lecturer. He's interesting and rather funny and puts just the right amount of pressure on people. Did you take lots of notes in the lecture? Yes, actually I did. In fact, several pages. I didn't think I had taken so many. I was that busy listening to what was being said that I didn't take many notes. Can I photocopy yours? I don't think that's such a good idea. You won't be able to read my handwriting. And sometimes I write them in English and sometimes in Arabic. Oh, let's have a look. Wow! Your notes are so neat. There's not much Arabic. There is on this page. Oh, yes, there is. Dr Adams would be pleased to see this, especially given what he was talking about. Don't you keep careful notes? Mm, sometimes. It depends on the lecture. I don't think I'll forget Adams's lecture today, but some of the detail will fade. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 25 to 30.
I type up everything afterwards, so you can have a copy then, and you can fill in anything I have missed. I'm not so good on the broader concepts. I'm better when it comes to detail. Just what Adams was talking about. Well, I am definitely a detail person. I need to have everything written down before、As、I can get the concepts clear in my head. As you listen to the next part of the conversation, write no more than complete four opposite. words. For questions I find all the detail to clutters up my mind, and I get and very frustrated. To which 30, was just what he was on about. No more than two he mentioned a book he'd written. He mentioned several. The one on space and the individual. Yes, called My Space. It's on the book list. So it is. I think I'll get that out of the library, or, or get my own copy. Did you get what he said about spatial awareness? I didn't really.、Oh, yes, it was fascinating. I can't be as eloquent as Adams was, but I know several people who are frighteningly intelligent. But they have difficulty reading simple directions, even when getting to places that they know very well. I find that difficult to understand. Everyone learns the way to walk to the shops and things like that. You mean just the way people learn spelling? You know, people misspell words, make mistakes in countless areas of their lives, and going in the right direction is just the same. Remember what Adam said about the number of people who cannot tell left from right, north from south, and so on. Do you know which way is north? It's、um, that way. You see. I couldn't have told you that. Really? I haven't a clue which way is which. That's why I'm always getting lost when I go out on my bike and put me in a completely new place, and I am totally lost. What about maps? I'm hopeless at reading them. But then you're brilliant at writing essays and getting all the ideas down in the right order, and I don't know where to start. Again, just what Adams was talking about. What we need to do is combine our skills. You teach me to cope with detail, and I'll teach you how to string concepts together. Okay, we can do that. Which way is the library? It's.、Uh, you're making fun of me. <laughs> That's the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture about writing for radio. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. We're going to move on today to look at some of the key principles of writing for radio. Of course, the main thing that you have to remember is that a radio script is not written to be read, but to be spoken and heard. Now, putting this into practice is more difficult than it seems, because writing as we speak. Involves abandoning many of the normal rules of writing that have been taught to us from an early age. This is because we need to concentrate on how the piece sounds. Written words convey information, but they don't convey the full meaning of what you want to say. They don't tell you what to emphasise, what speed something should be read at, or where the pauses should come. So these have to be indicated in a script. Whatever is said on radio. Whether it's a link to a magazine program, a film review, 
or even a voice piece in the news, needs to sound as if it's coming from the mind of the speaker, almost like part of a conversation, rather than something that's being read. Before you begin to write, it's a good idea to know who you're talking to, to visualise a typical member of the radio station's audience. If you're writing a film review for a local audience, for example, think about how you'd tell your grandmother about the film. Or if you're reviewing a pop concert, think about how you'd tell your friend about the band. The words have much more impact if each person feels they're being spoken to directly. So your tone needs to be informal, rather than using impersonal words like listeners or the audience. You can make it more informal. Include them in what you're saying by referring to us and we. Once you know who you're talking to, the next thing is to work out what you're going to say. Don't forget that the person listening to you has no opportunity to ask questions, and in the same way, you can't repeat what you've just said. For these reasons, it's important that your script is logical and progresses smoothly. Too many facts too close together will cause confusion, so space them out evenly. The best scripts allow listeners to visualize what you're describing. For example, instead of giving the physical dimensions of a field, describe it as being the size of, say, a football pitch. If you're talking about a tall building, relate it to perhaps a ten-story block of flats. Now, all scripts need something that will grab the attention of the listener. You need something that'll make them say, "Hey, I want to stop and listen to this." So the first sentence has to do this for you. It needs to be intriguing, interesting, and then it needs to be backed up by a second sentence that explains what you're talking about. The last sentence should also give your listeners food for thought, and can be in the form of a question. Or a statement that sums up the item. After you've finished your script, you need to polish it up, and the most effective method of doing this is by reading it aloud. This also helps you to avoid tongue twisters or words that you might find awkward to pronounce. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.